Welcome everyone uh, to the latest in our series of tiny machine, tiny ML auto machine learning tutorials. Um, it, if you might remember, or hopefully you've either seen it on YouTube or watched it live about three months ago, we had a, a really exciting forum event kind of bringing together a lot of different companies working on auto machine learning techniques for tiny ML. Um, as a follow-up to that, since we really only got to do uh, brief demos and overviews of each company's uh, tools, we have this whole series of deep dives. And so today we're going to talk to Stream Analyze. Um, as always, thank you to all the tiny ML strategic partners who kind of uh, support all these activities, help us all learn more about and help build the market for tiny ML. Um, a couple of quick upcoming events. So there is another uh, online event, the Tiny ML Neuromorphic Engineering Forum, uh, chaired by Professor Charlotte Frankel from TU Delft. It's at the end of September. Uh, you can see the link there. Just go to tinyml.org and you can find it. Uh, sign up. Looks like a really interesting and exciting um, agenda. Uh, some real uh, kind of fun bleeding edge techniques there. Um, for our next live event, uh, Coming up soon, as we were just talking about amongst the speakers, the Tiny ML EMEA Innovation Forum 2022 in um, in Cyprus is uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, a couple of really exciting um, speakers. Uh, you see Massimo Banzi from Arduino and Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli. Um, uh, I used to work at Cadence, uh, so I've seen uh, a Professor Alberto speak quite a few times, always exciting and interesting, really a guy who's seen an incredible amount happen in electronics and helped a lot of it happen uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, so definitely uh, sign up and go see that if you can. I think it'll be a really great event. To introduce our speaker, Magnus Guetta, it has a PhD in digital image analysis and uh, more than 10 years of work experience in software development and machine learning. He's worked on cutting plan optimization in the steel cutting industry, automation of microscopy imaging and analysis in the life science industry. And he's currently working on enhancing the vision and ML capabilities of the Stream Analyze Edge Analytics platform. Magnus, take it away. Okay, thank you, Elias. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you to the Tiny ML Foundation for letting us have this uh, deep dive. Uh, I know there's a lot of work going into these kind of um, events. So, and as you said, Elias, uh, my name is Magnus Yeda, and I'm a PhD in digital image analysis and a developer here at Stream Analyze. And uh, I'm working on, on enhancing the, the vision capabilities of the platform mainly, and also looking into the, the ML side of things. So, uh, for those of you who don't know about Stream Analyze, uh, we're a startup, we're located in Uppsala in Sweden. And the work is um, based on the work of a professor from Uppsala University. And he started this company along with a PhD student of his. And uh, they worked mainly on, on radio telescopes and uh, creating like a unified data model to be able to, to search through the huge amount of streaming data that comes in, in real time from, uh, from these uh, radio telescopes. And, and also um, worked on providing some analytics in searching through such streaming data. So the, the company is sort of a byproduct from that research. So that's where it emanated from. And it was founded in 2015 and it started to get some traction quite recently. And we work mostly with the large industrial companies and uh, foremost in the automotive industry, I would say. So uh, Stream Analyze, what do we offer then? Uh, well, we have a, a managed uh, streaming platform for uh, edge devices and uh, to help data analysts who want to, to get insights in real time and, and to automate operations by, by AI. And, and the platform, it, it does this by, by enabling a, a flexible and scalable uh, real time analytics on edge devices and also at the same time sort of severely reducing model development and, and deployment cycle. And, and you'll, you'll get a first-hand look at how this workflow progresses. So, so um, 
the platform Magnus. sort of enables you to work interactively with your edges and that sort of also enables you to get these short development and deployment cycles and you can also work on the real-time data streams which is uh, good for for making insights and and things like that and it also comes with a, a very large and ever increasing analytics toolbox with like uh, fast Fourier transforms db scans linear regression random forest k-means clustering and and things like that and it also facilitates easy deployment to large fleets of edge devices so there's there's no need for for firmware over the air updates when you want to deploy a new model and, and things like that um yeah so so what is it used for then this platform uh, and it's it's shown to be strong in in uh, areas such as data visualization data extraction and integration with third-party technologies such as can buses messaging libraries uh, libraries <laughs> libraries uh, and other streaming platforms and things like that and on the ml side um, um, we have a lot of um, customers working with anomaly detection and predictive maintenance and operation mode classification and, and, and things like that. So, and as you can probably figure out from the the points that I've listed, we're we're not really a traditional TinyML um, technology provider in the sense that um, we're not focusing on building and optimizing neural networks and then running firmware updates to to sort of deploy them on on the hardware. Uh, we, we do, of course, provide uh, neural network capabilities, and we have projects where we have um, um, used uh, like TensorFlow um, networks and converted them to our proprietary um, network models and used them for, for uh, operation mode classification and, and things like that. But when it comes to neural networks, we more encourage clients to develop um, models themselves using, for example, Keras or TensorFlow, and then use some other means to optimize them for the related hardware, for example, using OpenVINO or something. And our platform then is more about running the models and then tinkering with the data, examining if the models work, uh, detecting model drift and, and things like that. So you're, you're probably quite familiar, most of you, with, with producing uh, neural network models and optimizing them for hardware. So this demo is going to go more into some alternative functionality. We're going to look at a simple example for rule-based classification. And it's more to show you about the workflows and how you interact with the hardware, how you, you deploy um, your analytics to, to, the, to the edge device. And before we jump in, there's a lot of talking, but we're soon going to come to the demo. Um, um, for you to understand what you're actually actually watching when I'm doing the demo here, I first need to explain a bit about the platform. The platform basically consists of two pro products. It's the, the engine, which we call SA engine, SA for stream analyze. So SA engine uh, is one thing. That's the main machine that does all the work. That's what you install on your edge devices. Then we have SA Studio. And SA Studio is the front end that interacts with SA Engine. Uh, so it interacts with all the instances you have on all your different edge devices. And we will soon have a Visual Studio code extension also that can be used to replace the studio. But that's in, in active development and will be uh, probably available later this year. So. And when it comes to the engine, like the main machinery that you installed on the edge device, it comes in two flavors. There's a, like the full engine and there's the lightweight version. And the full engine, it runs on reg regular edge devices um, with a bit more capacity, like running a, a normal Linux distribution or, or a Windows or even a Mac and, and also for Android devices. Um, but when you want to run the machine, sorry, when you want to run an engine on microcontrollers, then you use the sort of lightweight version of the engine. Uh, and the lightweight version, it can run on, on microcontrollers with, uh, for example, an, an uh, operating system like RTOS. But it can also run barebone on the microcontroller without no operating system whatsoever. And the, the full version of the engine, it has a footprint of around five megabytes. And the lightweight version has a footprint about 40 kilobytes 
of main memory and then 300 kilobytes of flash memory, if I remember correctly. So, so if your hardware is, for example, uh, an ARM Cortex A5, then you would use the full S engine. And if you are running on an ARM Cortex M4, for example, then you will use the lightweight version. So. And to uh, understand what the difference are with the full version and the lightweight version, you have to also know a bit about what, what the engine ac is actually doing. So what it does is that it uses a query language um, to, to operate and make the, um, um, uh, to, to, to process the, the streams and to do the analytics. So um, the query language, um, when you write a query and you execute the query, that query gets optimized and then it gets compiled into machine code uh, using a just-in-time compiler and um, and then you run the query. So it's um, for the full version, all of that is done on the actual edge device. But when you're using a microcontroller, um, the query optimization and the compilation is done beforehand and then transferred as machine code to the microcontroller and then executed on microcontroller. But the workflow is uh, almost the same. So um, the workflow that we'll see today is applicable for both microcontrollers and normal edge devices. Um, the engine can also be expanded with uh, custom plugins written, for example, in C or Lisp or Java, and, and it can also be embedded in your own applications, and it has APIs for many different languages, and, and you can also write wrappers for new data sources. But all of these are sort of um, technical details that you can read about in the documentation. So, so that's a lot of talking, and now we're going to get our hands a bit dirty here. So we can start to look at, let's see here. Yes. So here's just our web page. And um, the, the version of the front end, the SA Studio that we're going to use today is in the cloud. So um, I also want to say that there is this uh, community edition of SA Studio. So you can, um, the community is what I'm using here when I'm doing this demo. So you can, also go in and just by registering with a name and an email address you can try the community edition uh, yourself and it, it it differs a bit from the enterprise edition but it's it's very generous so so you will be able to do a lot of stuff so um as the studio is accessed by going to studio.streamanalyze.com and once you have registered you will get to this control panel and on this page, you also have some information on how to get started. There's this user guide for Studio, and there are also a few getting started guides for different hardwares. And, and you can, oh, you can see you can upgrade and you can download for um, the engine for Edge clients. And it also links to doc documentation and stuff. But we'll head straight into SA Studio. So, uh, this is what you're greeted with when you get into SS Studio. It has uh, five different tabs. The primary one is the OSQL tab, and we'll get back to that one later. And sorry, then we have the flow tab, which is for uh, our sort of no code solution. Here you can use the function as building blocks and build up your queries. Um, but we, we won't cover that in this demo. And there's these integrated documentation site and you can uh, read the tutorial like there's a lot of information there's also a reference manual for the query language and, and um, also a lot of guides available um, and then there's this devices tab here's where you connect your device here's you, where you access um, uh, sort of the, the connection information you need to execute on the device in order for it to, to connect to your your instance that interacts with, with the SA engine on your edge device. And then there's just this normal settings page, which is pretty much similar to every front end uh, settings. So uh, let's see here. Yes. Uh, so this is the main um, interaction window. Here we have um, sort of a a code window 
almost like any um, sort of text editor. Uh, and it has uh, a large area here where you type your code. And then you can run the code by just pressing this play button down at the bottom. And also have, has an output window, uh, which you can toggle on or off. And also it has this um, selector where you can select which instance you are going to execute the code on. And uh, it's set for server. So um, this is ac accessing a default server instance of the SA engine. And then it's also, you can select how the at output is uh, supposed to be displayed. So we can just uh, one plus one, is equal to two. And for example, if we want to display a, a synthetic stream of the same stream, and we have to input a rate as well. And you'll see this is just a combination of sinuses that produces some output. If we change the output to text, you can see that it's just like a lot of numbers getting uh, streamed out from this function here. So I'm just stop the query by pressing stop and we can see the output window I can toggle it on and off. So here's where you write your queries and you select the device you want to run it on and then you get your output. So it's, it's a quite simple way of interacting with your, with your engine. So um, that's an overview of SA Studio. And what we're going to use today is um, we're going to work with, I have, a, let's see if I can see. Yeah, we have a Raspberry Pi Zero here with some, uh, it's a weather sensor on, which has uh, temperature and humidity and uh, air pressure. So, uh, I've, I'm using um, uh, a cord here for the power. Uh, you can also use like, um, there are these, these power boards as well. You can use with like a battery like this, but I didn't dare you do it today on the demo. If the battery would run out and that would be problematic. So. I'm using this power cord for powering the device today. So, so this um, will uh, use S engine on this uh, device and use this as an edge device. And it's uh, maybe a bit more powerful than a microcontroller, but uh, the purpose of this is to show the workflow and the workflow is the same with microcontrollers. And um, that's why I've, I've chosen this Raspberry Pi for today. Um, so, if we look at uh, the Raspberry Pi here, um, I have SSH'd into the uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, we can see that we have downloaded um, SA Engine. We just unpacked it to the SA Engine directory, and there we have a model directory. And then there was this um, code from the um, uh, from the sensor provider uh, in order to set up the sensor. So that's what we have here. And to be able to connect, we of course need to start the engine here. So we start Let's engine in. So now we are running as engine on the Raspberry Pi Zero here. You can see that it executes well and check out the system version, for example. We see that it runs the, the latest version 4.13.3. Um, so now we want to connect our Raspberry Pi Zero to our front end instance here so we can interact with it. So we'll just drag this away for a bit. So what we do is that we go to our devices tab and here's this sort of easy um, get started guide for quite a few um, hardwares and we'll just check the Raspberry Pi Zero. And it's a three-step process, but I've already done this. I've downloaded the SA engine and I've unpacked it and 
and check the system version. So what I need to know now is to, oops, sorry, I need to copy the connection blob and just paste it into here. Let's see if we can do that. So now it's going to connect and you can see down here that it says done. And it also says in the console, the edge pi zero edge is waiting for query from server. So we can also see in the edges list that we now have a pi zero edge connected to our front end instance. So if we go back to this window, we now we can use instead of the server, we can execute on the pi zero edge. So if we execute the same stream now, this stream is actually being generated on the Raspberry Pi Zero and not on the server instance that we used before. So let's stop that one. Um, okay, so now I've prepared a documentation for this demo. Let's see here. Um, our documentation is, it works like this, that um, if you're reading the documentation inside the integrated, integrated documentation on in SA Studio, it works as a sort of a Jupyter notebook. So you see here, each of these um, sort of black boxes are basically small versions of the OSQL window you saw here. So it works exactly the same. So this means that you can execute the code snippets in, um, in the documentation and they are, they are uh, connected to the instance. So, so here you can see that the PyCR edge is sort of um, already chosen as default for these kind, uh, for these code snippets. So um, what we need to do now is we have a Raspberry Pi Zero, we have downloaded SA Engine, we have sort of installed, we have unpacked SA Engine, and we have also connected the Raspberry Pi Zero to our uh, SA Studio. Uh, so now we have the means of interacting with it. And in order to get the readings from the sensors, we first need to load some code um, in, in this engine that can access the sensors. So that's what this is doing, load model, pi0, BME280. BME280 is the name of the sensor board. I think it's from Pimeroni and, or Pimeroni, maybe they're called. So we load this, so it should say just start OSQL. So now we have loaded the code and also we want to start feeding the sensor values into ascending. So we just use the start BME command here. And you see that it's executed on the Pi edge. So now we get a, a process ID there. And now we can check out what kind of signals does the sensor provide. So we execute the signals command. We see that it has a temperature sensor and a pressure sensor and a humidity sensor. So that's fine. So let's have a look at the sensor values. Um, we can do this by the command signal stream uh, and you supply the name of the signal which you want to, um, uh, which you want to look at. And I didn't mention this, but um, these black code boxes, you can either press the play button and then we'll, that will execute everything in the code window or you can put the cursor on one line and press F2, and that will only execute that uh, line or the consecutive um, commands, which is in one paragra paragraph. Or the third option is to select something and press, um, I think it's control enter to execute only what is selected. So we'll try that. I'll select signal stream for temperature here and out comes temperature readings. Um, the code that accesses the sensors, it, it, um, 
gets one reading per second. So you'll see the temperature readings here, one reading per second. And it's 21.2 degrees Celsius in here. It's, it feels a bit colder, but I'm not going to, um, I think it's correct because we have this, uh, uh, this connected with some cords. So the sensor shouldn't be affected by any uh, heating um, heat source in the nearby. So, so these are the temperature readings. And then let's see the pressure readings. It's 985 kilopascal, I think it is. And then we have the humidity. Let's see the humidity. It's 46 something percent humidity in our office here. It sounds about right. So now we examined the three signal streams from the sensors. And as you could see, there was a lot of the extra digits in which were not really necessary. So you can just remove some precision by calling the function signal stream, for example, for temperature, and then extract the values and then round them off to two decimals. So by doing this, we just get temperature values with two digits, two decimal digits. Okay, so, so that was the um, sensor readings individually. Let's say we want to combine all three values into single stream. And here's where it starts to get interesting. And I'm going to explain a bit more about this. So, so I, first of all, I just go through what this does and then how it works behind the scenes. So first of all, we extract the temperature signal stream and bind it to the T stream variable. And then we extract the signal stream for pressure and bind it to another variable. And finally, we extract the signal stream for humidity and bind it to H stream. And then all of these three are combined into one, um, like a single vector using the, uh, or a single stream using streams pivot, which we return with this select clause. Um, and you see that this is also wrapped in a create function call. So this, what it will do is that it will create a function that's called all signals, and that will output one vector with all three values as a stream. And um, when I run this, since we're using the full version of SI Engine on the Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, this query will be um, it will be sent to the Raspberry Pi to the SI Engine instance on the Raspberry Pi, and on that edge device it will be optimized and it will be compiled into uh, machine code and, and then we can run it from there. Had I used a microcontroller instead, then by pressing play here, it would have used my local S engine instance to optimize the query and to compile the query and then just send the uh, machine code to the microcontroller. So there would be no processing on the microcontroller itself. Only it will only receive the machine code and then be able to execute the machine code. So, so now I press it and we get the function ID back. So now this function is available on the uh, S engine instance on the Raspberry Pi Zero. So we'll just try it out and see if we can get all signals at once. And you see it works quite, quite well. Quite difficult to read. This should be the temperature. And here's the pressure. And here's the. Ah, um, and also the, the humidity. So let's say that we want to maybe output it in a more human readable format. We can use the, the function we just created the all signals function, which is now available on, on the Raspberry Pi Zero. And we extract the temperature, the pressure, and the humidity. And then we put them in a string, which we format in a more human readable format. And then we just 
output the result. We emit the result. And we've wrapped this in a function called get readings, which will provide a stream of strings then. So we create this function on, we're still on the Pi Edge device. Now the function is created, we get the function ID. And now we just start the stream. So now we get the readings on a boom or human readable format. Less decimals and with units as well. Okay, that's all well and good. So now we can access it from our um, from our front end, our studio instance here. But let's say that we have some sort of um, monitoring center. We have a monitoring center somewhere, and we said, okay, this monitoring center wants to monitor this device. And um, we can do this by um, emitting the results, like the streams, to a messaging service. So for example, here we have a support for MQTT, which, which is a messaging protocol. And um, it's um, supported directly on the, the SA engine instance. So what we do is that we load the system, which is the extender sa.mqtt on the PyCR edge here. And then we just set up some connection options. And we want the quality of service to be one. And we want to uh, broadcast the messaging to this um, public MQTT broker. And there are a few different to choose from, but we choose this Mosquito uh, public MQTT broker. And then we have a client ID for our client. So now we have some connection options, and now we just register the client by using MQTT register client. Okay, so now we have registered an MQTT client on our SA engine instance on the um, Pi Zero. And uh, let's see if we can broadcast something. So what we'll do now is just to um, set up a listener. So I just start a listener here. So this is now listening to uh, the public uh, Mosquito uh, MQTT broker called testmosquito.org. And it's listening on the topic Pi Zero slash SA engine. So if we publish something now on Pi Zero slash SA engine, it should end up in this window. So, so we'll try to publish from the Pi Zero Edge device. We do this with the publish uh, command. We'll just publish the, uh, the one single string, hello from Raspberry Pi Zero. And we'll publish it to the MQTT, uh, sorry, the, the Pi Zero slash SA engine topic. So we'll try this. Uh, so now we're publishing from the Pi Zero, and you can see that it ended up at the public MQTT broker. So now it has sent the message via the network to the public MQTT broker without going um, past anything else. And uh, yeah, this is just the, the result from the, the query uh, that is passed to, to, the, uh, to the studio instance. So now we can try and publish uh, a stream from the temperature sensor, which is done in the same way. We have our signal stream, and we're just publishing it to the Pi Zero uh, slash SA engine topic. And as you see here, we get the readings from the public MQTT broker. So now the temperature readings are being pushed to the server. And we can easily read them using any, any device or any monitoring center, sensor that can talk to an MQTT broker. OK, we'll just turn this off for now. Um, now it's publishing the stream just, just values. And maybe we want it in some kind of format, that, um, another format. So what we'll do is that we'll create a new function called my temperature stream, which um, streams uh, a JSON string with the temperature and the time that the temperature was read. So uh, 
we're reading the sim, uh, signal stream for temperature and binding it to the uh, temp variable, which we're putting in the JSON record and we're rounding the value to two decimals. Uh, so we create a function on the pi zero, and then we just test it, test the JSON stream here, and we see that we get um, a string containing a JSON record and with temp, temperature values, and also the timestamp for the reading. So that seems to work. And now we can publish uh, the stream on the MQTT topic. So we're publishing the function that we, oh, sorry, the stream from the function that we just created to our topic that we're using. So, and now you can see here in the terminal window that the JSON records are coming to the MQTT broker, the public MQTT broker. So that's might be better, sorry, might be an easier way for transferring data um, since a, a sort of a monitoring center can easily uh, use and process the, the JSON queries. So let's see if we, we can use, there's this, um, um, sorry, there's this application called MQTT Explorer. And I think we can use this as our virtual uh, monitoring center. What it does is that it can listen to uh, public MQTT brokers. And uh, as you saw, I, we published to the test mosquito.org and I have set this up to listen to the topic pi zero slash SA engine. So if we just uh, connect this and now there's no data coming, but if we once again uh, start this publish this stream of temperature values. Uh, we see that this topic is being populated. And if we choose it here, we can plot the temperature. And we see that the temperature is, it's around 21 degrees here. But now I have my sort of temperature changing device here. So I'll try to see if I can um, change the temperature with this and see if we can and get any readings on the MQTT Explorer. I'll just mute myself so you don't get this loud knob. So as you saw, I um, blew on the temperature sensor with a hairdryer and you can see that the, um, the value for temperature increased quite rapidly. And now as it is cooling off, it's going down slowly again. So, so this is just like monitoring the sensor values through SNDN on the edge device. Um, that's just what it's doing. So there's no real intelligence yet, um, and we're we're getting to that. But that's um, one of the basic parts that you can uh, interact with and watch your your uh, streams, your value streams in real time to get insights on how, how is the data working? What is, what are the, um, uh, does it have any peculiar um, characteristics that you can examine? So, so that's, that's for, for displaying that. So what we'll do is just to, to kill the stream for now, but let's say that, oh, uh, we're not satisfied with monitoring in, in the temperature in Celsius, we want to monitor it in Fahrenheit instead. So that's an easy fix to do because it's very easy to, to tinker with your models once they're deployed. So um, what we can do is just to create a function that is a, a linear transformation from uh, Celsius to, to Fahrenheit instead. So we have this function C2F, Celsius to Fahrenheit. We take the number and just makes the linear transformation from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And we just create that on, um, on the pi zero edge. So now that function is available. Then we can go back. We just scroll up here to our, where is that? Oh no, that was here. 
sorry, I'm making you confused here. Okay, so here's my temperature stream, which took the signal stream from the temperature sensor and rounded up. So we'll just insert all to the C2F function here, which will convert the temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And then we just redeploy this function on the Pi Zero Edge device. So this will overwrite the old function. So now the function is available with the new code. So then if we start the stream again, let's see, where are we? We are here. Um, we can also publish it. And if we look at the plot, we can see that it's now outputting. Uh, we can see that in the window here as well, in the output window. Now it's outputting um, temperature values in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. So that was the extremely easy fix just to change the code and redeploy. And we didn't need any firmware update or anything. It's just changed the, uh, the code uh, on the fly while the device was active. So let's uh, change it back to regular Celsius and redeploy the method. Okay, so now my temp, uh, temperature stream is once again outputting sensor values in Celsius. Okay, so now let's put in a bit of intelligence in this as well. So what we want to do is we want to detect temperature changes. And how do you detect temperature changes? Well, the easiest thing is to use a, a regular derivative and um, to, to create the derivative, you have to um, you have to make a window, and then you can um, take um, consecutive values and make a difference. So, so what we'll do here is just we'll we'll create a window of temperature values. So we have our signal stream of temperature, and we create a window containing five values, and we want to emit the result every value. So every time there comes a new value, we will out put the five most recent values. So it'll take, since it's one value per second, it'll take five seconds for this one to output any result because it has to gather enough data first in order to produce the window. So we'll just run this and wait five seconds and I'll start outputting values. Okay, so here's the window of the last, the latest five temperature values. I'll just stop it and show it again. So you'll have the latest value at the end of the vector and the second to latest value and the third to latest value and so on and so forth. So now we can create a simple derivative by just taking the difference between the latest and the first. Um, so we do this by creating a function. <clears throat> We have, here's the exact um, query that we used to produce the window. So we store the result in a vector here, and then we take the first value and the last value, and then we just take the difference between the first and the last. And we want to output a message depending on what the difference is. So if the difference is less than minus fast, uh, sorry, <laughs> less than minus five, then the temperature sensor is really cooling off quite fast or the device is cooling off quite, quite fast. And um, if the difference is only, uh, okay, minus five, that's like one degree Celsius per second. And um, if it's, the difference is minus one, then it's, it's just cooling off. It's not fast, it's not slow. And if the difference is between 0 0.2 and 1, then it's cooling off, but, but quite slowly. And if it's between 0 0.2 and minus 0 0.2, it's sort of near zero, then it's, it's steady. It's not increasing, it's not cooling off, it's not warming up. And then, and, uh, well, in the same way as the cooling, if you get positive numbers, it's warming up. So 
if it's between 0 0.2 and 1, it's warming up, but quite slowly. And if it's between 1 and 5, it's warming up in a normal pace. And if it's above 5, if it's above 1, increasing more than 1 degree Celsius per second, then it's warming up quite fast. Then we want to, to have a message about that. So maybe it should be also a warning that your device might be going to overheat or something. Um, so we'll just create this function. And then we'll just watch what it outputs. So we're running it. And it you don't remember it takes five seconds, and then it outputs a value every second. So it's steady, it's steady, it's not warming up, it's not cooling down anything. Um, but what if we do like this? We can also plot it at the same time. We'll just clear the data. Um, and we also need to publish the values. So we're publishing them to the MQTT broker. So we have one stream publishing to the MQTT broker, and we have one stream outputting the state stream, the one we configured in this function here with the differences. So it's steady. And now I'm going to, once again, use this uh, hair dryer. So I'll just mute, mute myself short, short while. Okay, you can see that it started warming up uh, as the graph increased here, we got these warming up uh, messages from um, the, the, the function that sort of classified the, the temperature change state. And now you can see that it's cooling off, but in quite slow, it's almost reaching a steady state. See, maybe we haven't really um, sort of um, calibrated the values um, perfectly yet for, for this um, rule-based model. Um, okay, but it still sends out, even though um, the state is the same, it still sends, sends out one state every second. And we don't really want that because we want to have sort of re reduce um, the data that is getting transferred. So we can use this by um, creating a new function called temp state, and it will only take the values that are changed. So we, we do this and then we run it and see if we can only get the states when they change. Now you could see that when I warm the sensor with the hairdryer, um, we only get messages when the state goes from one state to another from the transition. So we have a data reduction here. And you can see that it was warming up and then it was steady and then it was cooling off again. And now it's sort of alternating between cooling off and, and being in a steady state. So that was a simple model, um, sort of a, a rule-based model. Um, it, you saw how it was easy to tinker with and to change and to update and to use Fahrenheit instead and, and also to use data reduction. And, and um, for, for this is, it was suitable for this kind of short uh, demo, but you can of, of course use more advanced models and it will work about the same. You can use like um, either, uh, more complex uh, rule-based models, like um, if uh, the temperature dropping and the pressure is dropping and the humidity increasing, then there's the risk of rain, for example, or you can use maybe a random forest classifier or even a neural network. Maybe you have trained your neural network to detect temperature changes in, in the weather sensor, and then you can just import it and, and run it here as you've run this, um, this rule-based model. So, 
Uh, I'm not going to go into aggregate values because I say that we are getting a bit short on time. I'll just sh uh, mention shortly that um, we we have sort of built up this um, this model uh, by executing um, like creating functions uh, in succession, and we have done it manually. But you could what you could do is just um, you see here that we have some user models. You could sort of gather up all these, um, uh, all the functions that we have used and put them in a model like this. And um, that, uh, that will sort of save you a lot of uh, energy and you don't have to, to type and, and try them out each one uh, at a time. Um, so what you could do here is just Let's see if I can show you. Um, we'll just do roll back. Okay. Um, what you could do is that you could, um, as I said, you can you can gather your code, your functions in one of those models, and then you can just deploy the model to your edge device with a simple click. And that will sort of deploy all the functions at once to the device and set it up in any way you want. Uh, here I've sort of divided up um, for a bit of granularity. So we have the temperature, um, the code for the, the temperature model in one model and the code for the MQTT setup in one and uh, also the code for the, the sensor readings in one. And of course, they can all be put together in one single model, which is deployed um, um, either from this um, either from this um, front end or from a script or programmatically. So, so you don't have to interact to deploy models um, for, for all your devices. If you're satisfied with one model and you have like a, a large fleet of devices, then you can use a script to programmatically deploy them to um, to all those devices without having to, to uh, do so much manual interaction as we have done today. So what we've shown today is more about how you examine and, and, and work interactively with your, with your device. So I think I will stop the demo there and see uh, if there we can progress to the um, Q&A session. Great, thanks, Magnus. That was uh, excellent. Very interesting. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, Tomas answered a few of them offline, but I thought we'd go ahead and ask you. Um, so I think for the Raspberry Pi, when you needed to, you know, deploy the code or or do updates, that was all kind of over Wi-Fi. Is that right? Um, yes, that's over Wi-Fi. And um, and when so this question's more my own um, when you're like you mentioned there's also the lighter weight version of that uh, SA studio when you're on a, a microcontroller how do you do those kinds of updates yes um, I'm I, I a disclaimer here is that I'm working more on the analysis part so our, our uh, my, microcontroller specialist uh, um, probably can answer this in a more more um, um, in a better fashion, but um, I think we have used like a, a serial communication, um, if, if that makes sense, to to transfer over a serial bus to to the microcontroller. And I don't know about uh, the sort of wireless capabilities of of the microcontrollers for this uh, transfer uh, protocol. Okay. Am I jump in here and uh, you know if you have a decent wireless connection uh, it's fine with our customers it might be 4g connection but but uh, other others are, are fine so basically some kind of internet connection is what is needed uh, uh, during the the development cycle right when you think with your models you deploy them redeploy them and, and so forth um, when uh, models are in, in production deployed to, to lots of edge devices, intermittent connectivity is fine too. You can make the models work autonomously. Hope that was, was an answer. Yeah, makes perfect sense. 
Um, uh, another question uh, that came in was on um, using LWM to M instead of MQTT as a messaging system. If that's an area you. Yeah, um, I don't think we support that particular system at the moment, but uh, it's quite easy to extend the support for for new messaging protocols. So uh, uh, the this, the protocols that we support now has been <clears throat> on a client need basis. So um, <laughs> yep. if, if if there's need, of course, there will be support for that. But I don't think we have it at the moment. Uh, maybe you, Thomas, know more about that. No, I just pretty much gave the same answer. We, we can check it. But the platform is, is quite uh, extensible and, and flexible. And, Another example of, of communication technology that uh, we work with quite a lot is, is Conbus, which is uh, widely used in the automotive industry. So quite a few of our customers are, are large automotive companies. And then uh, Conbus kind of is the way that different parts of the car communicates with each other, right? So we tap into that and integrate it into our engine and thereby you pretty much have any kind of streaming data that, that you want to, to work with. Yeah, and I think that in our microcontroller projects, we have used something that's called Zero MQ, if I'm not mistaken. That's also a messaging protocol that mm -hmm. I think is used widely in microcontroller um, related areas. Yeah. Cool. Okay, you have one last question, which might be a whole nother uh, tech talk, but uh, <laughs> the question is, um, I'll, I'll let you give it a shot in two minutes. Um, can you show an example of a machine learning running on SA? Show an example of machine learning on SA. Um, yeah, um, since this is an, an sort of auto ML forum, um, it it's definitely deserves a, 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 a deeper, um, like uh, a whole other tech talk. But w what we have done is, for example, we have um, done uh, driver mode classifications for different vehicles, it's like uh, from uh, inputs on different, uh, like the steering wheel, the gas, and uh, the brakes, and things like that, and how they are operating things um, to determine, using in your network to determine what kind of um, operation they are actually doing are they uh, moving from a to b or are they transferring something if it's like uh, is it there an extra weight in the the vehicle and and things like that so it's determined what is the vehicle being used for at the moment so that's like um operation classification uh, that's one and um about the automail also you should mention that um it's it's quite easy with a bit of tinkering to sort of rewire the the outputs of the models back into the model and adapt to that to to get a sort of federated learning um, <clears throat> situation. Um, but we we don't have like direct support for federated learning at the moment. But it's quite easy to accomplish with a bit of tinkering, and uh, and also with the uh, automated deployment that could also be part of the uh, entire automail um, sort of idea, really. So. Cool. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and uh, thanks very much for attending. As I mentioned at the beginning, as I flip through all of our uh, kind of strategic partner uh, sponsor slides here, which we always get to do at the end of these talks. Um, you know, thanks again for attending this auto ML. Um, a deep dive session. There are a few more coming up um, as we continue to get through all the companies that are interested in showing more. Um, please do, you know, check the tinyml.org. There are, uh, there's signups there. You can find the dates and times. Um, I think we have them going through the middle of October at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks again for attending. We really appreciate uh, your time and interest and uh Please feel free to reach out to TinyML if you have any other questions. And there we go. Oh, my goodness. There's a lot of partners. There's some of us. Uh, there's Keekso and Stream Analyze. So there you go. All right. So thanks very much, everyone, for attending today. And have a great day.